Hey guys, welcome to the fish room. I'm Rachel O'Leary and it is time for a Tuesday tip. I'm going to be continuing our discussion on quarantine if, and if you remember correctly that is simply the forced isolation of in this case a fish to prevent the transmission of disease both to the new fish and to your existing stock. So I've gathered in front of me um, sort of a bunch of stuff that I like to have on hand for my quarantines and Granted, my application isn't the same as your average hobbyist. At any given time, I may have 30, 40, 50 tanks in quarantine. So there's a few things that I do sort of um, to protect myself from myself, you know, get a little feeble-minded. So uh, what I try and do is make sure that no matter what, I am not cross-contaminating. This is a really big deal, and sometimes I think people forget about it. You, you shouldn't share nets, you shouldn't share siphons, you shouldn't share anything like that when a tank is in quarantine. Everything should be kept separate. So what I like to do after I add the fish to the, quar to the quarantine tank is take some painter's tape or even a dry erase marker and write on the tank what the fish is. I mean, of course I know, but it's, you know, just something I do, and the date that it came in. Now, I also have these little slips, not sure if you can see those or not, um, that you can use, but I find that they stick to the glass a little too much and then I have to use a razor blade to clean them out. But the information on them is good and that says date in, the release date, treatment, and the reason for treatment, and whether it's a quarantine or a hospital tank. And the difference between a quarantine and a hospital tank is, is a quarantine is preventative, a hospital is active. So what I also do is I keep a little notebook and I write down each species I get in, the date, and if I do any treatment, as well as, you know, sort of a daily log. So if I'm going to deworm something and it needs multiple treatments, I can keep track in my notebook so that I keep to the appropriate timeline for the med and so that I can, you know, write down if there's any losses, any symptoms, things like that. Another thing that I do is keep these little neon colored um, stickers and you can use electrical tape or you could use your painters tape but I like to have you know I have six different colors here and what I do is for each net that I'm going to use I take one of these neon stickers and I put it on the handle and I label it for the tank that it's going to be used for um, so this one will be for my rainbow shiners in quarantine. So I'll just write rainbow shiner. And then this way I can keep it separate from all the other nets that I have. I'm not sure if you can see behind me here, but I have hundreds of nets. And this is just one way that I can make sure that I don't cross contaminate. Another thing that I do is as soon as I'm done with the net, it goes net side down into a bucket. Um, if it's a clean net, it goes net side up, and that's just something I do so that I can keep track of what equipment's been, been used. So, last time I told you about how to set up the little bins and things like that, um, I've since gotten in, I think about 15 species of fish, all of which are in quarantine. And I've gone around and I've labeled each tank with the fish. I have my equipment set up um, so it's separate. And we talked a little bit about, you know, looking for disease, recognizing disease. And we're going to talk more about that today. Now, I'm very much of the mind that less is more when it comes to medication. I mean, if you think about it, meds are inherently toxic. They're made to kill organisms. So I, especially with the small, delicate, fragile species um, that I generally work with, I try and keep my medicating to a minimum. You know, I find the vast majority of times if we keep up really good water changes, keep the tank really clean, the dilution cost from that helps to get rid of any issue that might crop up. There are some exceptions, um, and sometimes I prophylactically treat wild fish for intestinal parasites. So unless we have a microscope, or if it's like a really obvious disease like ick or um, you know some of the external parasites that are you can see with your naked eye, the reality is we are guessing with our meds. 
Now, the trick is to make an educated guess. And what I would recommend to most of you is to really go to the University of Florida's website. They have some excellent disease information on there and it can give you a good idea of where to start. To be on the safe side, if you know you're gonna be getting in a bunch of fish, there's a few medications that you can keep on hand. Keep in mind, medications expire and they're not cheap. So you don't wanna to have too much on hand that you could potentially have to throw away. I keep metronidazole, um, fenbendazole, praziquantel all on hand for deworming. And then I keep salt on hand. Um, I keep extra heaters. I keep Paragard, which is an alternative to formalin. And I keep some antibiotics, but I rarely ever use antibiotics. Almost never. I'm gonna try and not go too deep into this, but I wanna give you an idea of some of the things that I see. First is ick. Everyone knows what ick is. It's that grain of sand uh, type lesions on the fish, which are actually cysts. Um, and it's, it's probably the most common and easiest to treat protozoan parasite that, that we deal with. Most often, it tends to occur when there's been a buildup of organics. So like the fish are overcrowded or they've been in dirty shipping water or, you know, situations like that husbandry has kind of gone down. Maybe you, your heater died and you didn't know it. The tank got real cold and warm. It's, they seem to happen most when the fish is stressed. Now, I, there are lots of different treatments for ick. There's plenty of commercial meds. Most of them work. Uh, for the vast majority of species, you're fine. There's um, quick cure is a good one. I still like to use salt for some species, not all. Uh, crank up the heat and add some salt at two teaspoons per gallon, dissolved and added over time. I find that to work really well. Uh, quinine is a really excellent treatment if you can get it. Another thing I see a lot of is Chylonidella, which I think that's how you say it, which is, um, it's, another, it's another protozoan parasite, but it shows up in sort of like milky gray patches on the fish. Basically the fish excrete a lot of excess mucus, they'll flash, they'll rub, and then they'll get complications from that. It's treated the same way as ick. Um, you can also use copper, which I do not do in this house because I have so many invertebrates. Um, that's just a death sentence. Plus, it's a really tough med. And it's also important to know your alkalinity if you're using copper because it, re it behaves differently in different water parameters. Potassium permanganate is a med that some, some old timers especially will recommend. Um, it can burn the gills. It's an, again, a really tough med, so I don't use that here either. Formalin is one that's often recommended, and that one's not as bad, but you have to remember with, if you're going to be using formalin that it affects the oxygen content, so you really need to crank up your aeration. Same thing goes if you're using heat and salt the hotter the water, the less dissolved oxygen. The next thing that I see is flagellates, which is velvet, kochia, um, hex, you know, those sorts of diseases. And again, they're relatively easy to treat with the same treatments as the, the previous diseases. And then what is most relevant to me as someone who gets in wild fish is dealing with nematodes. Now these are the intestinal parasites, and for these I use fenbendazole or praziquantel. Now with intestinal parasites especially, it is best if you can get the med into the fish through ingestion. So they need to be eating. Um, but it saves you a lot of money, and it's a more direct delivery method to kill the parasite. So what I do is I use Rapashi Superfoods, and I dose the, the food by volume. You want about 0.25% of med to the volume of the food when you're making that. And what's nice about that is that the food absolutely reeks, so the fish are very drawn to it to eat it, and that way they get that, that medication that they need. Another thing that's super, super important when you're doing your quarantine is water changes. I mean, you're putting fish basically into a new setup, crowded conditions, without any decor, so you need to keep up on those water changes. I will do daily water changes on most of my quarantine tanks. And what this does is, again, you're removing you know, any pathogens, you're diluting the pathogens, you're providing the fish with better water quality, which helps boost their immunity. And you're also going to be feeding a really good diet when they're in quarantine. You wanna do a lot of live or frozen, 
you know, a really good powerful menu so that they are getting fat, so that they're pooping a lot, so you can see what they're pooping. But this also means that you need to remove all that waste and frequently to prevent a spike in your nitrogen cycle. Another thing that I'll do is, uh, I don't have an, an unopened package, um, but what I do in all of my quarantine tanks that are not being medicated is add just a chunk of this poly filter, um, about a piece this size, which is about postage stamp sized. And what poly filter does is it adsorbs and it absorbs. So it's going to remove any trace amounts of ammonia as they're occurring. It'll get rid of dissolved organics. It'll get rid of heavy metals. Um, it's, it's just really great and it changes color to show you what it's filtering out. So this is a way that you can put more fish than obviously you would stock long term into a quarantine tank and sort of um, monitor it for the nitrogen cycle before it becomes critical. So it turns bright yellow when, um, when there's an excess of ammonia. So I'll drop a square of that in every quarantine tank. I mean, I still keep doing my daily water changes, um, but it just sort of lets me know if, if I need to do even more. We'll talk more about polyfilter in the future because I think it's a really great media. It's also, it does not need to be inside a filter. It can just be dropped in the tank because of the, um, it being able to adsorb and absorb. So just to recap, the next step in our quarantine is labeling our tanks labeling our equipment, keeping everything separate, doing a lot of water changes, feeding really well, and taking notes on what we see. It's really important in quarantine that you keep track of what's going on. You don't have to use a notebook. I'm sure there's an app for that somewhere. Or if there's not, someone that'd be a good idea. And then be prepared when you're getting new fish. Have a few meds on hand. Um, so that if there is a problem, you're not trying to source meds and get them in after the fact. Really research before you just throw meds at fish. They are toxic. You need to have at least an educated guess on what you're treating or the meds themselves are going to weaken and kill your fish. So I hope that helps. Make sure you stop by my Facebook as well as my website, MsJinx.com, for my upcoming speaking engagements, my current stock list, and information on all things nano.